So I came up here to give a little tough love. And this tough love, if you haven't noticed, all of these songs were about love, about loving Jesus and knowing his presence and being one with Jesus, which is loving people. And something that got me, that God was working through this whole week is stop being concerned of everything going on around you. That's not what is important. This world is going to it's going to tear you apart if you try to focus on it. What you need to focus on is God's love and sharing his love that is in you because that's what's going to change the world, not us. God's love, not us. God. So it's just been on my heart because so many people are caught up in it. And I'm like, why? Why are you caught up in it? I mean, it's in God's hands. It doesn't concern us. What concerns us is sharing his love. That's going to change the world. And I wanted to come and tell you guys this to encourage you, not to put you down, but to encourage you and get off what's what's on your mind and just focus on him. That's going to change you and that's going to change lives and that's going to change the world. So be encouraged with that. Be encouraged and give thanks for what he's doing, even if we aren't certain. But be encouraged. Good word, huh? Yes. It's so good to know that God reigns, right? Doesn't matter what happens, God reigns. He's greater than everything that we're going through. And I like what she said. Um, I know this scripture was sticking with me this week too, was um, Jesus died, when Jesus died and rose again, he was on the earth for 40 days. And he met many times with the disciples and they were always scared somewhere. They were hiding out somewhere and he'd walk into the room when there was a a locked door and he'd speak to them. And um, every time, the Bible says in Acts Acts 2, it says every time they were gathered together, the disciples always said, Jesus, when are you going to restore the kingdom? Every time it said, when are you going to restore the kingdom? And I know those are some of my questions. Like, it's like, we're like, what's going on? What's going on? And Jesus said to them, the Father's the only one that knows. The Father's the only one that knows. You're not permitted to know. You're not supposed to. It's not for you to know. But this one thing I promise you, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you will have power. And you will be my witnesses in your city, in your in your community, in your country, and to the ends of the earth. Isn't that awesome? And so we can stand, we can, we need to focus, and we need to remember God reigns. Yeah, so no fear. We don't need fear. So we just praise God today. I just want to just declare over our nation, declare over our church that God, you reign. You are the king above all kings, and you conquered it all, and you finished it at the cross. When you died, you rose again, you finished it, you defeated the foe, you defeated the enemy. And I thank you, God, that you've given us the authority and the power to walk in victory. And I thank you, God, that this church, we just declare victory in this church, in this people, in Jesus' name, and we thank you, God, that your kingdom is expanding here and around the world. We thank you, Jesus, for the victory. Well, church, and uh, everyone who's joined us online, it's great to have you joining us today. It's a great day to come in the congregation. I was glad when they sent it to me. Let's go to the house of the Lord. And um, I just felt so good coming in here and praising and joining with everybody. So love you guys. Um, Greet your neighbors, and we'll... Go on with the rest of the service. Well, God's good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Um, We have a privilege this morning. Uh, It's Well, it's a super privilege for me because um, we get the privilege of dedicating a a little one. And uh, so if they want to come up here right now, um, bring whoever you want to bring. (laughs) Except don't bring everybody in the whole church up here. But whoever you feel like you want to bring, bring Stan and Sherry for sure. Um, this, is, of course, is my little grandson. This is my son, Jeremy, his lovely wife, Katie. And this is my grandson, Benjamin, Benjamin David. And um, he's, he's actually, his middle name 
comes from this big tall guy here that's um, Stan, it's Stan, looks just like Stan, but a bigger version of Stan. <laughs> Stan, uh, what's the computer talk uh, when it's bigger? Two, yeah, Stan 2.0. But, uh, so we're so glad um, we get that privilege, you know. Um, I say this a lot when, when I dedicate children. You know, uh, Jesus, when he was on the earth, you know, the Bible tells us that he was our example. We should do what, do his works, what he did. And uh, one of the things that Jesus would do is that he would bless children. He would take them up in his arms and he would bless them. And uh, so I always think, you know, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he was here today, what would he do? And I think he would take children up in his arms and he would bless them. Because I think he, there was, and it wasn't a meaningless or just kind of some kind of a religious, um, a religious, uh, you know, whatever, what, obligation or religious performance actually was, there was a significance in it. Because when the Bible talks about when they would bless people, uh, it, it says that that blessing would follow them. And even though at times, you know, they'd hit bumpy patches, but that blessing would always bring them slowly around until finally they got back on the right path. And so there's a tremendous power in our words and in our blessing. And, um, and, you know, I think about this, um, you know, when, ch when God gives us children, um, he get, it's like a bless, it's, it's like a gift. And I like that verse where it says, every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, of whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. And so this, um, this gift, is, his name is Benjamin David, and uh, he's a cute little guy. <laughs> he's, he's got tremendous potential, and he likes me. So, and that doesn't happen very often. So, um, but anyways, yeah, it calls me Papa. But anyways, so um, I just, uh, I always like to ask the, the parents to make a commitment to raise their children up. So before God and these witnesses, you guys make that commitment to God and to raise little Benjamin up in the fear of the Lord. Yeah. Set before him the right kind of an example. And lead him to Jesus at a young age. Yes. Amen. Praise God. He's got, he's got rhythm in his soul, Benjamin. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. <laughs> so Stan, why don't you come here, Stan? And, um, I want you to pray too, if you will. Because yes. this, um, this is our grandson. We share this grandson together. And uh, I just want to release some words over him that will follow him all the days of his life. Amen. So you guys want to stand with me? Just maybe agree with us in prayer as we, 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 we bless little Benjamin here. Lord, we just thank you right now for Benjamin. Lord, we just thank you. We just lay our hands on him because, Lord, we know that if you were here in the earth, this is what you would do. You'd, you'd lay your hands on Benjamin. And so as your representative in, in your name, the name of Jesus, we release a blessing over Benjamin right now. We just thank you, Lord, that he came to this earth by your design, your plan, and that you have a purpose for his life. And Lord, you put gifts and abilities inside of him right now, Lord. We just pray for a release of those gifts and those abilities, Lord. We just declare over him that he will know you at a very young age. He will come to know you. He will never know days of waywardness. But Lord, that he will not just be a good boy, but he will be a spiritual boy. That he will be a intuitive, Lord, that he will hear your voice and respond. And Lord, we thank you that he will be well physically all the days of his life, that he will never know long times of sickness or disease, Lord, but you'll keep him safe and in the hollow of your hand, Lord, and that he will be alert, alert mentally, Lord, that he will, we declare over his life that he will be alert to the, to the things of God and be able to grasp things at a very young age. And we just thank you, Lord, for putting such an incredible personality inside of this little guy. And we just bless him. And Lord, we just thank you for giving the family wisdom and raising this child up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Uh, Lord, uh, there are many generations before him that have sought your name and have called you their Lord and their God. And a matter of fact, there's four generations, including little Benjamin, that are right here in this house today. And they have all served you with all their heart. And so you have come from a long line 
of people that have loved God been. And so we pray for There's been many prayers over you, even before you were born, that you would pick up the mantle of the Almighty God. And that you would carry it. And you'd light your candle on the front porch of hell. And man, the, the, the living God would beat within your heart. And wherever those little feet of yours would travel and go, there God would be. Yes. And that is your life, my son. <laughs> yes. So we thank you for him, God. We, we thank he is a gift to us. He is such a joy to us. We love him so dearly, and God, we know that you love him more. So we bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, <clears throat> hold it. I got to tell you, uh, Jeremy, he, um, I, I guess there's some wrestler that has the people's elbow. You guys ever done that? So he, Jeremy does that to him. So the people's elbow. <laughs> God bless you guys. Anyway, it's kind of like an inside joke, you know, the people's elbow. It means you're, I'm going to come over there and, you know, do it. Anyways, praise God. Well, it's awesome to have generations of kids in church, love God, serving God with all their heart. It's awesome. It's wonderful. It means more to me than anything in this world. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I just uh, want to receive the offering at this time, and we're, we're going to give you the opportunity, Matt, when you want to come here, we're going to give you the opportunity, um, we're, we're going to take a regular offering, but also uh, we're trying to raise money for, well, I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> well, we're in continuing to help um, 17 orphans in India, and uh, I was just thinking back a little bit, I remember as a child, hearing the story of, of George Mueller, who God called to help orphans and wound up having an orphanage with like thousands of kids to feed every day. And we get, we get to help with 17. And I was just talking to Jacob, the fellow who is overseeing that over there um, yesterday or the day before, and uh, talking about school. And of course, with this uh, virus situation, um, in their school, they have a private school that we're helping the kids attend. And uh, so even over there, they're having to figure out, well, how many kids can we have in class and still have enough room so people don't get sick and such. And so Jacob's having to make four trips a day back and forth to the school, uh, shuttling the kids, um, this class, then this group, and then this group and such. And um, also I was reminded talking to Jacob and said, so these, these kids, some of them are going beyond now what your level of education was. And he was like, yes. Um, because of financial reasons, he had to stop um, before finishing high school himself. But he really has such a heart. He's like, I want each of these to have this much. If they have this much education, they can kind of get a good job. And if they get this much, then I'm confident they can get out there and um, stand and uh, be able to support themselves in a family and such. So he's got a vision for them. And uh, so right now, um, because of this different year, we got to pay in a couple, uh, what do you call that, couple installments. So we're up to bat for the second installment in January here. And uh, we're looking to raise around $3,000 ballpark. Um, that would include that, the two sec finish off the uh, tuition that's needed. And then also last year was the first year that we got to help with um, some health insurance, actually, for all the kids for, um, for a very amazing, a small amount. They get full coverage for the year, and that was uh, actually very, came in very handy this last year. And um, we got more back than what we got to put in. Uh, imagine that with insurance. So anyhow like to encourage you uh, during, during offering time, if you just ask God if, if he'd want you to uh, help along these lines, we'd sure appreciate it. Bless you guys. Praise God. So um, the ushers to please help me. If you'd like to give toward the orphanage, just put right on there, you know, this is for the orphanage um, and the orphan kids. So anyways, we uh, want to take care of that. If you, so if you need an offering envelope to write that on there or write it on your check, 
you can make them out to Destiny Church. But that, but if you give, if you want to give toward that, make sure you tell us that because this offering is a, our general offering plus for the orphans. So if you want it to go toward the orphans, make sure you put it on there so that we know we'll separate then. All right, that makes sense. So if anybody else needs an offering envelope, you're giving toward the orphans. I, I appreciate your giving. Um, we have not skipped a beat. As you can see, we've done a lot of updating in the church here and a lot of remodeling. And uh, you guys made it all possible. So I, I appreciate so much your faithfulness to give during this time because I know a lot of churches or some churches have suffered financially. and We have not. And uh, so we're appreciative to God for that. Let's all pray together. Lord, thank you that we have this great opportunity to give. And we just pray, Lord, that you will multiply the seed that we have sown and that you increase our harvest of righteousness. We claim that for this offering now in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, man. You can pass the offering buckets. I just want to mention a couple things. There's a Ladies Connect group this Thursday evening at 6.30 right here at the church. It's for all ladies. And, um, and so don't forget that. Um, if you have changed your address or your information, please let us know. And then if we don't have your information, you know, like we just had a snow, uh, snow, not a storm. I don't think it was a storm. It was kind of a nice little gentle uh, uh, snow, whatever, fall. But, it, you know, if in case there is like a storm or something, sometimes um, this road out here gets pretty bad and we have to cancel church. And so if we have your information, we'll let you know that we had to cancel. So if, you, if we don't have it, please give it to us. Um, if you're willing. And then also there's a, there's a, against the back wall there in the lobby, there's a whole thing of books. Most of them are Christian books and uh, we're trying to get rid of them. And so they're free. You, you can just take one. So look it over there and go ahead and take it. And so in that good news, you come to church, get free books. Go. Amen. Well, let's pray over our, our sermon. Lord, thank you that we can give Thank you that, we, that you love us, that you care about us. Thank you that we can help orphans. And now, Lord, we just open up your word. We just trust you to speak to us out of your word today. Thank you, Lord, for helping us powerfully in this sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to open your Bibles, if you have it, to Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to talk to you this morning for a short time about a message entitled, The Truth is in the tension. The truth is in the tension. And um, trying to discover what is, uh, a lot of times when you look at Bible doctrines or you look at Scripture, it seems like there's contradictory statements that are being made. And uh, sometimes when you listen to sermons, you'll hear a sermon and it seems like uh, it's, it's saying something. And then you might hear someone else preach another sermon. It sounds like they're saying something totally different. And you're going, what's going on here? And, and sometimes you're, you're more, you gravitate toward one particular truth because maybe at, at a time you need those truths. But there is tension to truth. There is there's a certain degree of, uh, of tension involved. And the truth generally is somewhere in the middle. You know, the Bible says about Jesus, it says that he was full of grace and truth. He was full of grace and truth. And so grace is this, I love, I love grace. I love to preach on it. I love to experience it. It's this incredible, welcoming, accepting uh, attribute of God, is that God doesn't look at you, and you have to be perfect before he accepts you. It's unconditional favor. He favors you. He accepts you unconditionally. And that's an amazing thing. And the Bible tells us that we're saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, for by grace are you saved. We're saved by grace. But then the other thing that Jesus had was he had truth. It said he had grace and truth. And, you know, there, of course, grace has truth to it. But then there's an aspect of truth where it's more of a, uh, where we, we're being challenged, where, where, we're, where God is giving us some direction or giving us some correction in our lives, where he's talking to us about kingdom principles, about things that we're supposed to do. And so there's like this, there, there's almost like this uh, a balancing act that we have to, we have to come to where we, we hit a, a, a balance in between grace and truth. You know, it's like some of the books of the Bible, 
uh, like Ephesians, for example, there's three parts to the, cha- to the book of Ephesians. The first part is three chapters long, and we would call that the grace part. It's what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago on the cross and how we've been com- become accepted in the beloved and how he has raised us up and he has seated us in heavenly places and uh, he is showing his glory and his presence in, in us. And, and the first three chapters of Ephesians is a wonderful, wonderful study. If you ever want to study something that would just make you feel really good about yourself and just like, wow, this is awesome. But then in chapter 4, he switches And he starts saying, seeing how that you have been raised with Christ, seeing how that you've been accepted in the beloved, seeing how you're loved and and, and all these things, your sins are forgiven and all these things. Now, and then he starts talking about how you should walk and how you should live your life and the attitudes you should have. And he starts talking about uh, some practical things, which we would call maybe truths or principles of Scripture that you're supposed to walk out because we're saved by grace but we're set free by truth. And so truth is something that we have to embrace in our life. If we want to really experience freedom, if we want to have God's best in our life, you've got to experience truth. And then the last part of Ephesians is what we call the warfare part, which is only a few verses long where it says, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then it talks about standing against demonic forces. And so... When you take all of it as a whole, it seems like there's tension, but somewhere in the midst of the tension, truth is found. How many can see what I'm saying? So you could almost listen to a sermon and you could say, this is a grace sermon because it's it's filled with acceptance. It's filled with God loves you. He cares so much about you. And all of it is true. But then you can listen to another sermon and say, you need to get your, you know, where they talk about What is required of you, how you ought to live your life. You're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. And that is a different aspect of the same gospel. And we need it all. How many know that's true? And so there's this this tension. And I want to try to, uh, I hope this goes good, because it might not. But I believe believe that it will go good. And so, uh, and and I thought about this. I was trying to think of ways, uh, different ways I could illustrate tension. So here's another, uh, another thing is, is with parenting. There's, there's different uh, philosophies about parenting. And so I used to teach on this, and there's the, there's the authoritarian parenting style, and then there's the permissive parenting style. When I was a kid, the authoritarian parenting style was the craze, if you know what I mean. You know, children are supposed to be seen and not heard, uh, you know, kind of like that. Uh, my dad actually said this to me. He's in heaven, so forgive me, Dad, for saying this. But um, and he, was, he was more like the authoritarian-type parent. Um, and, and he would say things like, do as, I, do as I say, not as I do. You know, have you ever heard that expression? And the authoritarian parent was kind of the, the thing in the day. And, but now it's kind of switched to the permissive parent. You know, so now, the parent, now everybody is emphasizing the, the permissive parent. And, and so we're, we're characterized by, oh, it, you know, the child is the center of everything. You know, the child is the center of the house. The child is the center of our world. The bad thing about both of the extremes is that they create problems. This permissive parent creates a self-centered child that thinks that the whole world evolves around them. Thank you for your enthusiasm. And they think that, that, that and, and when they go out into the real world, that's, they can't figure out why, why everybody in the world isn't evolving around them. And they, come, they become very disappointed. That's why when, you know, it's, I, I don't want to be political here, but uh, when Donald Trump was elected the first time, the, you know, the mean orange man was elected president. Um, they used to, in the, on the campuses, they had safe place rooms where the college kids could go in there and get a hug because they were so discouraged or so upset about the orange man being accepted, being elected. But I won't get into that because that's a totally different thing. But, but those are extremes. Those are two extremes. One is, a, one is um, a permissive parent. One is authoritarian parent. And somewhere in the tension in the middle is really where parenting should be done. How many follow what I'm saying? And so... They all have truth. And that, that's what you'll find out is that everybody has, or most people that preach from the Bible, they have truth. But it has to be, 
it has, we have to find that tension in between the two. Otherwise, we're, we just won't have uh, a good balance in our approach to Christianity. And so, and so I was thinking about these two statements that we hear a lot of times. I hear it a lot. Is The one statement is, God's got everything under control. Have you ever heard that statement? God's got every, he reigns above it all. He's got everything under control. And hear that, and that's actually a truth that you could, you could talk to about a, a situation. You could say about this situation, like, you know, uh, God's got everything under the control. Some of us are concerned about the direction of our nation. But we could say God's got everything under control. And I think that would apply, especially if we pray for our nation and we believe God for our nation. We could say God's got everything under control. And that would apply. But then the other side is, how many of you ever heard this? God helps those that help themselves. How many of you ever heard that expression? God, that's actually not a Bible verse, but, it, but uh, God helps those that help themselves. But actually, there are verses that, would, would, that you could say that. In other words, we were talking about raising kids. You wouldn't want to say, when you're talking about raising kids, you wouldn't want to say, well, God's got everything under control. I mean, that, ver that statement wouldn't apply there, right? I mean, there's certain aspects that maybe you could believe God to, to overcome all your mistakes and help you. But, but the, the, the statement that would probably work better when you're talking about raising kids is God helps those that help themselves, right? In other words, you've got to be an active parent. You've got to be in the trenches with your kids. You've got to be challenging their dysfunction and their behavior, and you've got to be able to direct them. You should never talk about raising kids in church. But anyways, you should be able to, you should be directing them. You should be able, you know, putting your principles, your values. And so basically, in, when you talk about raising kids is, is the, the phrase that works better is God helps those that help themselves, right? And so sometimes what happens is in situations that we find ourselves, we don't hit a good we don't hit a good tone. We, we, we say things, God has everything under control at the wrong time. Amen, Steve. I mean, because in this situation, personal responsibility would work better in this situation. And so I find almost like in every situation of life, there are certain things that I can't control. There's certain things I can't control, and I have to release that to God. I have to say, God, you, are un you, you got everything under control. You got this. But there's also things in situations where I have to do some things. I've got to act. I've got to uh, take initiative in this situation. Otherwise, it's not going to turn out good. I can't say, well, God's got everything under control. I need to lose 30 pounds. God's got everything under control. It would probably... That phrase probably wouldn't work there. How many know what I mean? You know, I want to get in shape. I want to be able to walk upstairs without going. <sighs> God's got everything under control. And probably God helps those that help them. In that situation, it would probably be, why don't you do something? You know, why don't you do something and God will come along and help you as you do it? So, so what I'm trying to say is that there's a tension there. And, and sometimes we... we we, we say God has everything under control at the wrong time because there's some situations where we need to act. We need to act in this situation. And I've actually, you know, one time I would, when I uh, pastored a church in Minneapolis, we were trying to find a building. And we had looked at several buildings. And in Minneapolis, it's hard to find cheap meeting places, you know. I mean, we had rented places and then people, you know, we'd show up for a meeting and then they had, had scheduled something else for that meeting, and we had to meet on the street. And, you know, it wasn't a real good situation, so we were looking for a building. And it was hard to find a building that we could afford in, in that situation. But we had looked at some places, and I was trying to go, God, which, which one do you want us? And, and finally, I was getting no answers. And so I got so desperate, I fasted. And, you know, if I'm fasting, you know what desperation has set in. And so I, I actually fasted. I went without food, no food, just water for, for, for three days. And I went away somewhere to the woods. And so I was in this place in the woods. And on the third morning, I woke up and I heard this voice say, not, not out there, but inside me. I heard this voice say, I don't care which building you get. 
just get one, that, just pick one out and get it. And I'm going, I mean, I couldn't at that point say, God's got everything under control. Because now he's telling me, just pick one out. It's almost like God's saying, I can't stand this indecision any longer. Just pick one out, would ya? you? And go with it. You know, I'll work with you. I'll help you. It's kind of like that. You know, it's kind of like that tension between those two situations. And sometimes I find people say, God's got everything under control at the wrong time. And, and, and sometimes we try to change things that we can't change. And we focus on things that we can't change. And we focus so much on them. Why? Are you, and we're all upset about something that we have. We can't change. You did what you could. Now you can't change it. So leave it in God's hands. You know, I, I mean, you know, that's true exactly when you raise kids. I mean, you raise your kids, you get them to a point, you... You're, 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 you're taking your hands on. God helps those that help themselves. You're, you're, you're doing what you can do. But they, how many know they get to a point now they're not, you, you can't control them any longer. I mean, now they're a little adult and they, they're going to make decisions. And, and sometimes the decisions that you, they make, you're sitting there going, that is a horrible decision. <laughs> how many have ever had that happen? That is, how, are you from me? I mean, I, come on. You like from Mars somewhere. That's I don't even know where you came from. I remember one time you want to hear a funny story about raising kids. I was going to talk about raising kids, but, you know, we, we were pretty careful about what our kids watched and listened to. And so John was a little guy and we were and my wife was driving and we we didn't even say shut up in our house. And we said shut up. Everybody's like, shut up. I mean, the kids probably said shut up to each other. In fact, they probably said a lot of things, but I'm just saying that what we, what we said, we were careful because little eyes are watching, little ears are listening. But so, so John was sitting there and, and my wife turned the, something on in the car and John goes, what the hell? <laughs> and, and my wife, my wife, she almost drives off the road, you know, arr, arr, arr. what did you say? <laughs> I mean, she... Then she thought, caught herself like, okay, don't get crazy. You know, don't go crazy. You know, like, they, this is the Antichrist stuff. You know, this is, you know, that's kind of how you feel, you know. And, uh, but I guess what happened was we, we had let him watch, was it George of the Jungle or something? Which was a pretty good movie, but I guess they said the word hell in there. Uh, the whole movie, he fastens on that and has to say that word, you know. Anyways, I don't know why I said that, but, but my point is, so, so, so the thing is, is that you, you, you do your best to a certain point, then you've got to leave it in God's hands. And if you focus on it and worry about it, what happens is your effectiveness gets less and less in situations of life. Your effectiveness, how effective that you're going to be becomes less and less. So you always, because what happens is when you focus on things you can't change, uh, it creates in you more helplessness. You feel helpless. I mean, if you just take 10 things in your life that, that you're maybe you're concerned about that you can't change. I mean, you can pray. I'm not diminishing prayer. Please mister, don't misunderstand me. I'm not diminishing prayer, but I'm just saying that you can't literally go there and change it. You can't change it. And so if you focus on that, like you can't, fo you can't change the past. How I many that's true? You can't change the past. You can keep the past from defining your future, but you can't change the past. The past is the past. You can't undo it. You can't change it. It's, it happened. You can't change every person in your life. I've tried. I can't even get my wife to agree with me. <laughs> even though I'm right. Right? <laughs> say, I'm, say right. I mean, even though I'm right. We just have to avoid, we avoid certain subjects because it just doesn't, it doesn't go good. And you know, uh, I, I better be quiet. So anyways, so, so, so the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that if you focus on the wrong thing, there's certain things when you, when you, when it comes, when you come to it, you got to say, God's got everything under control. God's got this. I remember I, I had an incident, you know, a few years ago 
where I was really being squeezed bad. I won't tell you this whole situation, but I was being squeezed bad. And I kept praying, and I was, it was really bothering me a lot, a lot. But what was happening was out of my control. I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't do a thing about it. And, but I couldn't get my, you know how it is, you can't do a thing about it, but you can't stop thinking about it. And, and so I'm sitting there, and actually, I, I, one of the things that helped me was I, I would sing. You know, and, and you, 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 you go, you sing? Yeah, it ain't pretty. And it, I mean, it doesn't sound good either, but, it, but I would sing. I would just sing. I'd just start singing songs. I'd just start singing worship songs. You know, his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. I see. <laughs> because I always hope you would join me. Hey, I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Does that move you at all? That moves me. I, I like that. But anyway, so, so I would sing to try to quiet my soul. Try to, and finally, in the midst, I got quieter. And all of a sudden, God's, I heard this voice inside say, God said, go on with your life. I got this. I go, what? Are you kidding? Go on with your life. I wrote down in my little journal, go on with your life. I got this. God's got this. And in the end, God worked it out. It was bumpy at times, but God worked it out. In the end, God worked it out. There's some things I can't change. But I can say over those things, God's got this. And there's some, but there's some situations I don't want to be saying, God's got this. I got to say, God helps those that help get in there and do something. How many can see what I'm saying? And so... I want you to just look at a story in the Bible. So there's a, maybe you've heard the serenity prayer. I mean, it's kind of like it's pretty common. I used to hate the serenity prayer. It used to bug me. I just, oh, God. So here's the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Like I said, there's some things you can't change. You can't change the past. How many know this is true? The, you can't make the devil go away. I mean, the devil's here, and he's going to tempt you. You can't go away with that. They te the devil tempted Jesus. If the devil tempted Jesus, he's going to tempt you. And there's tests and there's trials in life because we live in a fallen world. Those tests and trials that come into our lives, and you can't change that. There's some things you can't change. So here, here's what the serenity prayer is. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. I think that's a tremendous prayer. I, you know, I, even though I, I read it, the first few times I read it, I thought, that really bugs me. Because, you know, I like to feel powerful. Don't you like to feel power? In every situation, I want to be in control. I want to have, I want to I want to control the direction. I want it to go a certain way. I want it to end a certain way. I'm going to pray fast. Whatever I got to do to make sure it goes that direction and I don't like the idea that I have to accept certain things. But there's certain things, like I said, that you cannot change because they're under somebody else's control. It's someone else's life. I mean, if you think about this, the Bible tells us that God's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody to perish. How many know there are people that perish? So why do they perish? Because God lets them choose for themselves. God lets them choose their own direction. And God will let you choose your own direction. He'll let you make your own decision because love does not create puppets that pulls everybody's strings and makes them do what, they want, what he wants. I mean, if you, wouldn't it be something if I said, I hear I have my wife, I love her, I adore her, but I keep her chained in the basement. <laughs> How many would say, oh, you really love her? And she can only say what I want her to say. That's it. I make her. Somehow, I don't know how I would do that because she doesn't listen to me. <laughs> I'm thinking about doing a marriage thing because we, you know, we... Anyways. <laughs> I 
My mom, she, my mom was funny, you know, I, when she, she's in heaven. But, but what was funny about her is that she, if, if we started arguing, me and her, my mom, she wouldn't keep arguing. She started humming. <laughs> so I'm going, so I, especially if I started winning the argument, which is usually what would happen. That's my perception. But anyways, <laughs> and so she would start humming. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm going, where are we going with this, Mom? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know. I can't even remember where I was now. <laughs> but anyways, huh? I was in the basement. <laughs> oh, I, oh. I thought this, I was telling a story about the basement. You know, I'm, I'm in the basement, yeah. I'll be sleeping in the basement. <laughs> but, but so, I think I was trying to say, you have to focus on things you can change, something, things you can do something about. Because you can't change everybody. That's, I, think, I think I was saying that, wasn't I? I feel like in the back of my mind, I, had, I was making a good point. I can't remember what it was. But, but let me, let's look at this verse. This is good. We'll look at this verse. And so in Matthew chapter 25, just for time's sake, maybe I won't read all these verses. Maybe they could put, you could put them up there. But in Matthew chapter 25, uh, it's the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents. Most of us have probably read this parable where the master goes into a far country and he gives talents. Now, talents are not abilities. Talents are measures of, of money. It's actually money. Tal- that's what they call their money, talents. Some of the modern translations say he gave to one five bags of gold, to another two bags of gold, and to another servant one bag of gold. And so then he went away, and it says that he gave these talents or these bags of gold to each servant based on their own ability. And so and the, the word ability there is the Greek word dunamis, which means power, supernatural or God's power. So according to each man's ability. So if you look at the, the master as a picture of God, what, what, what you see is that God gives the, the servants ability, supernatural ability, but then he gives them something to use, take that ability and to, to use it over. In other words, here's some money. I want you to take this supernatural ability and I want you to do something with this money. And so the guy that he gave five to got five more increase what he had given. And, and so the Lord said, um, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And the second guy that had received two talents, same thing. He gained two more. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. But the, I want to focus for a little while here for just a couple minutes. Actually, my time is already up. You guys take a little bit more? Because I've not really gotten to my sermon yet, but I'm getting there. Yeah, I know, it's bad. Somebody in the back row just went, what? So we'll hurry. Um, so, so, the, so the one that had served one talent, here's what he did. He, see, you got to understand that the, the guy that had one talent had supernatural ability given to him by God. And he had the ability to manage this one bag of gold. He had that ability because God gave him what, based on his ability, gave him a bag of gold. And so he took that bag of gold and he dug a hole and he buried it in the ground. And then when the master came, now this was really interesting. When the master came to him and said, what, you know, basically, what did you do with the bag of gold? And the one that had received one talent came and said, Lord, now listen to this. This is his concept of God. Lord, I knew you were a hard man. You were a hard man. The word hard man means you are, you are severe, you're unreasonable, you're harsh, you're a hard man. I knew you to be a hard man, unreasonable, harsh. And then he goes on to say that you reap, you expect a harvest from where you never planted any seed. And you expect to receive from where you never made a deposit. And, but when you think about that, Here's a guy that God had already given to him, gave him supernatural ability and gave him gold. And now he's he's, I gave. Now I'm expecting something from what I gave to you. I'm expecting something back. 
And he goes, you've never given, you're this hard, harsh person, unreasonable. You've never given, you, you don't, you've never given me anything. And now you're expecting me to give you, to, to return something on your investment? You're unreasonable. And, and, and the master said, you wicked and lazy servant. And then he went on to pronounce some kind of a judgment against him. You know, in this story, I remember one time when I read that, because I thought, well, God, first of all, if God is harsh and severe, none of us would be here. I mean, that's not really the attribute of God. It doesn't say, our, you know, God is harsh and assure. It says God is love. It's, I, I like where it says God is rich in mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us. I like that. Rich in mercy. That means you got to, his mercies are new every morning. I like that type of stuff. But he's telling you what he's like. I remember some, I remember I talked to somebody one time who was, um, had, had, had come to the end of his life and he had not been a, a Christian or not been a prayer, prayer to God. And I started talking to him about his soul. And he goes, you know, I feel like a little bit like a hypocrite. Because I've, I've ignored God all my life and now I've come to the end and I want God. And he goes, I just don't feel like, you know, God would accept me. And I said, well, that's what mercy is all about. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's what grace is all about. And I had to talk to him about grace and about mercy. And so what, what, the concept that this man had of God is not true. The other thing that this man, first of all, his image of God was wrong. And I remember I asked the Lord about this one time, and the Lord said, don't get your theology from somebody that I said is a wicked and evil servant. Amen? But the other thing is that he, he denied that there was a law of sowing and reaping. But I want you to know that there is a law, I'm going to finish with this, there is a law of sowing and reaping. Amen. You should say amen to that because um, unless you're all sowing the wrong things. There's a law of sowing and reaping. Oh, crap, you know. <laughs> I was hoping there wasn't, you know. <laughs> you should be going, amen, praise the Lord, you know. There's a law of sowing and reaping. Yeah. Woo! Shouldn't be going, oh, you know, crap or whatever. Shouldn't be going, what the hell? Look, look here, let me finish this with giving you one, ver one more verse. Give you one more verse here. In Galatians 6, verse 7 through 10, it says, it says, do not be deceived. I like the fact that he starts that out. Don't get this wrong. Don't let anybody kid you about this. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. For he who sows to his own flesh shall reap. From the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so he says here, don't get this wrong. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So there is, listen, listen to this. This is a real, I want to make a profound statement. So I got to tell you, I got to tell you it's profound before I say it. <laughs> you go, say it, we'll judge if it's profound or not. There, listen, there is a response that God is looking for in every situation that we're going through. There is a response that God is looking for. There is a response that he is either spiritual in other words, it's, when I say spiritual, I don't mean spooky. I don't mean Casper the friendly ghost spooky. I mean the Holy Spirit leads us in line with Scripture. There is a scriptural response that the Holy Spirit will prompt us in every situation that we're to make. And when we make that, when we make that response, what happens is we plant a seed. We plant a seed. So in other words, when I'm, listen to this, when I'm going through difficulty, when I'm going difficulty, I'm going through difficulty, if I start praising God, that is a, that is a spiritual response. 
Because what I want to do is I want to complain and gripe and, 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 and why, God, don't you love me? I mean, what the, you know, what's going on here? I was going to say what the blank is going on, but I, I used the word hell twice. So I'm not going to use that word anymore. But, um, but, but, so, so, but God is looking for a spiritual response in a situation. And when I'm, this, this is so powerful. What I'm about to say is so powerful. When I make a spiritual response, I plant the seed. I put a seed. In, I put a seed in the ground. When I'm, I'm sowing now after the Spirit, because the, how many know the Bible tells you that to rejoice in difficulty, rejoice in trouble, rejoice in those things. When I'm, when I do that, I'm planting. I'm sowing to the Spirit. I'm sowing after the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is leading me in line with Scripture. Because I mean, how many know that when you go through things, you can't do the whole Bible. Holy Spirit, show me what to do. I mean, come on, help me. Show me in scriptures what I'm to do in this situation. And that's why the Bible is written. It gives you all kinds of different situations and what they did. Like Paul at midnight when he was in the inner prison, what did he do? He prayed, began to sing songs of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening. So he wasn't just humming to himself. He was belting out, brother, his eye is on the sparrow. He was belting it out, and they were listening. Go, whoo, that guy can, can't sing a lick, but he seems to be singing about something. And all of a sudden, he's sowing, he's sowing to the Spirit. And here it comes. All of a sudden, there came from heaven this incredible thing. Here it came. Brrr. I don't know what it looked like or what it, maybe it was an angel. I don't know. But came uh, uh, based on what he sowed. Sowed to the Spirit. From what he sowed, there came this harvest. Here it comes. The harvest is coming. Amen. The harvest is coming. The harvest is coming. The harvest is coming. The harvest is coming. He said, don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't go weary in doing the right thing. Why? Because the harvest is coming. If you've sown to the Spirit, if you've had a spiritual response in situations, if you've sown to the Spirit, the harvest is coming if you don't grow weary. There's a, there's a power. God is looking, watches our response. He goes, oh, look at that. That is, a, that is a godly response. See what happened to me. You know, I started thinking about all these different things about this guy that got the one talent. How many can see that? You see two, two, two sides there. You see the tension in that parable because God was the one that gave the ability. God was the one that gave the money, the talent. But then what they, they each had control over what God gave them. So you have God is in control, what he gives, and then what we respond, how, how we respond. We're responding a certain way. The guy that had five talents, he responded a certain way, got five more. Then he started reaping, started reaping. The guy that got two talents, he responded, got, he reaped. The guy that got one did not respond. Even though they all had ability, God-given ability, and they all had God-given money, but one guy didn't respond. And his, well, he did respond. He responded to the flesh. And so he didn't reap the reward that God wants to give us. Let's all stand together as the worship team comes. I was thinking about this because I know I've been a Christian, you know, since I was 17 years old. So I've been a Christian 50 years. I don't like to tell people how long I've been a Christian or been in the ministry because I don't want them to think this is all the farther you've gotten. <laughs> I don't want to discourage anybody. You know what I mean? That's what you... And so... You know, I've done some really great things. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I wanted to tell you the good news first. <laughs> I've done some really bad things. You know what I mean? I mean, I say bad, I don't mean scandalous, but I mean, it just like, you know, I had, you know, crappy attitudes. My, the, my biggest sin is attitudes. That's my biggest sin. And, and looking at things and, and looking at them wrong and interpreting them wrong and, and having a, you know, sour attitude or, you know, that, that's my biggest challenges. 
And so I'm thinking to myself, oh, Jesus. When I'm looking at this verse, whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. I'm going, so some of that I'm going, woo, glory to God, hallelujah. And then some of it I'm looking, eh. how many are with me? Am I the only one in this church that, that, that thinks that? I think that, I think that, oh, that's not good. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making an excuse for sin. But I saw this verse, as I was thinking about this, this verse came to my mind. Where Jesus, where, they, where the disciples told Jesus about these people that the tower, this tower of Siloam fell on them. Remember that? And they go, and, and the disciples are going, who sinned? Did they sin or that this tower fell on them? Because they always looked at it, if something bad happened to you, you got towers falling on you, buddy. You, you sinned. That's, that's kind of how they looked at it. But he said, Jesus said, no, no, you're all in the same boat together. But he said, you can do one thing. You can repent. He said, if you repent, I thought to myself, that's good. I like that. There's hope here. There's hope here. I can repent. And when I repent, when I truly repent, not just say, I repent, but I, mean, I truly repent, say, Lord, I repent. That it's like the seeds get get turned over, get torn up. And now I got, now I got the good seed in there. Of course, if I, I guess if I change my mind about the good seeds, I guess they go too, but I'm not going to change my mind about them. I'm going to keep them in the ground. I'm going to keep the good seed, the things that I have said, the things that, that my actions that have been prompted by the Holy Spirit that based on scripture, not some spooky thing, but based on scripture, when I do things that are based on scripture, prompted by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit always leads you, and that's how you can tell if this is, if I'm being led, is this in line with scripture? If this is in line with scripture, you're not being led. But the Holy Spirit leads me in line with scripture, and when I practice that, I'm sowing to the Spirit. So I just thought to myself, you know, it would be a good thing for all of us to do this morning. Because I already got you to admit that you got some good seed planted in the ground. You got some, eh, I, wish, I wish this wasn't in the ground. You know what I mean? But we can repent. We can say, Lord, I, I, re, I regret that. I repent of that. I don't want that to grow in my life. So how many would be willing to do that? So let's pray a prayer together. Let's just pray a prayer together. And, and I, I don't, I don't, I just want you to maybe pray this prayer after me. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that I'm your child. I am forgiven. I am saved by grace. But Lord, forgive me in these areas where I acted Unchristlike, forgive me. Uproot these plants. I repent and seek to sow after the spirit and not after the flesh. And I thank you for your forgiveness today. Hallelujah. As we're just standing there, maybe you want to say to the Lord, I just repent and just say some things which you repent of. I repent of saying hell three times. I just said it again four times in the sermon. I don't repent of that. I just repent, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help us see you not as a hard, austere father, but as a loving, merciful Father who cares deeply for us. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you, God, for releasing your people this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. Releasing your people this morning. Let's just pr sing this song together.
God, right where you're sitting there, standing there. Thank Him for His goodness. Thank Him specifically for His goodness to you. Hallelujah. Thank You for Your goodness, Lord. Thank You for Your goodness, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank You, God. 
Hallelujah. Let God hear your mouth say, thank you for your goodness, Lord, to me. Go ahead, say that one more time. Thank you for your goodness to me, Lord. Thank you for your goodness to me, Lord. Hallelujah. Personalize it. Thank you for your goodness to me. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. In God, he's good. We want to ask the prayer counselors to come forward. If you need prayer here this morning before you go, these prayer counselors would be glad to pray for you. And um, if you have any need, physical, spiritual, you need somebody to agree with you in prayer about something, uh, it's not, it's uh, just believing God that he'll do a great work in your life. And so we don't want you to leave without being prayed for. So if you need prayer, please don't leave today. I just bless you today. May God's face shine upon you and may this be the greatest week of your life. Amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you all. If you need prayer, please come forward. You're free to go. You're dismissed.